And I'm Diane Burns. Now, there are no suspects, no new leads, and no clues to where Tianda and Diamond Bradley might be. My kids that uh, has been missing, you know, for uh, four years, and it's, it's kind of hard. It's, it's very hard. On July 6, 2001, a mother leaves two out of her four daughters at the apartment to go out to work. She gives the girls the same strict instructions she always does whenever leaving the apartment. Don't open the door to anyone and don't leave the house. When she returns home, there is no sight of the girls, but a note is found in the home matching the handwriting of one of the girls. In 2001, Tracy Bradley was the mother of four girls, Rita who was 12, Tianda who was 10, Victoria who was 8, and the youngest, Diamond, who was just 3. Tianda Bradley was born on the 20th of January, 1991. She was described to be a lovely young girl who participated in track at school and enjoyed dancing. She even won local awards for her running and gymnastic abilities. Diamond, her youngest sister, was born on the 25th of November, 1997. The family distinctively remember Diamond jumping from couch to couch and had a knack for stealing other people's food. On that fateful Friday, July 6th, Diamond's father, George Washington, arrived at the apartment around 4.30 a.m. He spent a couple hours in the home before taking Tracy to work around 6 to 6.30 a.m. Tracy worked at Robert Taylor Homes, another apartment complex nearby hers, where she helped prepare breakfast and lunch for the residents. Tianda and Diamond were left alone in the apartment, Tianda being responsible for Diamond and given the strict instructions from her mother. Tracy lived with her four daughters, but at the time, Rita, the eldest, and Victoria, who was the middle child, were staying with their grandmother and were planning to celebrate Victoria's birthday, which was on Saturday. Their mother had made plans to take the girls, Diamond and Tianda, on a short camping trip up in Indiana with Diamond's father later on in the day. This never happened. During the course of the morning, after Tracy left her apartment, she made three calls to the home between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., which all went unanswered. It was very unusual of Tianda to not answer her mother's calls. Phone records indicated that multiple calls were made to Tracy's home from other numbers, but they also went unanswered, and there were two hang-ups. Tracy's shift had ended, and she was picked up by George, who also picked up some of her colleagues, dropping them off at their homes, before leaving Tracy at her apartment. Tracy arrived at her complex sometime between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. The front door of the apartment was locked. But when Tracy entered the apartment, her girls weren't seated on the couch watching TV or playing video games like they normally were every time she came back to the apartment. She ran to the back of the apartment, calling the girls' names. However, she got no answers. She checked every single room in the apartment but couldn't find her daughters. But what she did find was a letter. The letter was sitting on a lounge chair in the living room in Tianda's handwriting. The letter had stated that the girls were going to Tianda's school, then were making a quick stop at a nearby shopping center right across the street from the school. Tianda was enrolled in summer classes that summer at an elementary school just a couple blocks away from the apartment. So Tracy didn't find the contents of the letter strange, even though Tianda did break the rule not to leave the apartment. She just figured, that Tianda let Diamond stroll along with her to her class instead of skipping it entirely. As time passed by, the girls never showed up back at the apartment, and given that the school was an easy walking distance, the girls should have been home within reasonable time. Tracy started searching around the neighborhood for the girls on her own. Several children in the neighborhood testified that they had seen the girls in the school playground around noon, but none of the faculty or staff at the school confirmed seeing them there. Tracy contacted the police and reported her daughters missing just before 7 p.m., 12 hours after saying goodbye to the girls that morning. The Chicago police responded immediately and started their search for the girls. The search involved three beat cars, two supervisors, and two canine units which combed through the neighborhood. Over 100 police officers were included in the search. They searched lakes, lagoons, parks, paint factories, and much more. 
They even searched over 5,000 abandoned buildings in the city, but nothing came of the search. The search for the Bradley sisters would go on to be the largest missing person search in Chicago's history at the time, with a tip line that brought in over 800 tips but took the case nowhere. The police took on many leads, including an anonymous caller who claimed to be a minister and had a vision of two bags that were being casted out into the water. They also looked into a lead that the girls may have been buried in a nearby nature preserve after two areas were found with freshly turned dirt. The family suggested that it was unlikely that the girls were taken by a stranger, as both girls were relatively shy. It was also unusual of Tianda to leave a letter to her mother as she would usually just call or send a message directly to her mother's phone. The family also admitted that the letter wasn't written in Tianda's usual style and that the grammar in the letter didn't line up with Tianda's. Experts did confirm that it was in fact Tianda who wrote the letter, but the family questions if Tianda was persuaded to write the letter under false pretenses. In the early days of the girl's disappearance, people noticed that Tracy seemed uninterested in the case. She wasn't interested in following up on leads, and at one point, she refused to confirm if her daughters were present in a surveillance footage from a nearby store that had surfaced. Later on, the video had been determined as unrelated. She refused to interact with police whenever they showed up at her home for questioning or were there to discuss new leads. People also criticized her for the amount of time it took her to contact the police. Her response to this was, I just wanted to search on my own. I wasn't even thinking about the police. Any parent would do the same that I did. Tracy was never considered a suspect in the case. Police investigated two men who were linked to the girls as possible paternal connections. The first man was an unknown Moroccan man who had been paying child support for Tianda under the belief that he was her father. Tracy had filed a paternity lawsuit against him a month before the girls vanished, but the results came back revealing that he was not the biological father of Tianda and he had been wrongfully paying child support. It isn't clear when this man found out about this, but hairs matching the DNA of the Bradley family was found in his truck. However, testing could not show whether the hairs belonged to one of the girls or their mother. The FBI took a trip to Morocco but this revealed nothing. The second man was Diamond's father, George. Tracy and George had a rocky relationship, and things got even more complicated when Tracy became pregnant with Diamond. George denied that Diamond was his, but shortly before the girl's disappearance, Tracy demanded George to take a paternity test. The results came in just three weeks after Diamond had vanished, and the test determined that he was the father. There is a strange detail to this disappearance regarding George. The day after the girls vanished, Tracy's sister, Faith, decided to check Tracy's voicemail on her cell phone. Tianda said, Mama, this is Tianda. Mom, pick up the phone. George is at the door. Can I open the door? He said that we are going to Jules to pick up the cake there. We're coming to pick you up from work. There were other males in their lives that went by the name George, one of them being the Bradley's neighbor and family friend. He was actively involved in the search of Tianda and Diamond and was referred to a distinctive nickname by the girls that Tianda would have used over the phone. With this, the consensus was that Tianda was most likely referring to her mother's boyfriend and Diamond's father. But after that day, it seemed as if the voicemail vanished into thin air. Tracy's sister, who uncovered the tape, thought that it might have been accidentally deleted, and Tracy claimed that she's never heard it. This voicemail never made it to the Chicago Police Department as evidence, and detectives believe that this tape could open up promising doors in the case. Here's another strange detail. There's no record of a call made from Tracy's home to her cell phone that day. Now, George had done something he had never done, leading up to the girls' disappearance. He planned a trip. He was the one who brought up the idea to take the girls on a camping trip up in Indiana. George wasn't the type to make reservations, neither had he interacted with the girls on a level where planning a trip was a normal thing. And one thing, Victoria and Rita weren't invited, despite the fact that the next day was Victoria's birthday. George wasn't even fully prepared for the trip. He hadn't purchased any food for the trip, only borrowing minimal equipment for it. 
The day following the girls' disappearance, receipts indicated that George bought a package of 42-gallon contractor bags, gardening gloves, and a pair of neoprene protective gloves. Police searched his home, and five bags were missing from the roll, and his gardening gloves were nowhere to be found. A neighbor admitted that they had seen George burning something in a 55-gallon drum, and several people recalled seeing him loading it into the truck of his car and returning approximately 45 minutes later. George denied all of this, but the charring on the rafters of his garage, as well as striations in the trunk that matched the size and shape of a trash barrel, proved otherwise. People believe that it could not be the bodies of the young girls George was burning, as people would remember the distinctive smell of burning bodies. However, they do believe that if it was anything related to the girls, it could have been their clothes. A blanket containing hair belonging to Tiondas was found in George's trunk, but George claimed that he had taken Tracy and her daughters to a drive-in movie and made Tianda and Diamond hide in the trunk so he would not have to pay for their tickets, something their eldest sister denied ever happened. Also, the only drive-in theater was operational in Chicagoland at the time, nearly an hour away. George's phone records were looked at, and on July 6th, beginning at 4.30 a.m., he made at least 40 phone calls over a period of 24 hours. Between the time 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., there were no phone calls made on George's cell. This was around the time he dropped Tracy off at work and while the girls were presumed to have been alone in the apartment. Then from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m., no calls were made from his cell. But after this period, his calls pinged off at cell towers on the far south side of the city near multiple forest preserves and the Little Calumet River. At one point, Tracy reportedly told her cousin that if George had done something to her kids, they may be located where he used to take her walking in the forest. In 2008, a MySpace photo nearly identical to an age-progressed photo of Tianda law enforcement had created popped up. A forensic artist was brought in to analyze the photos, and they believed that the girls were one and the same, unfortunately. The identity of the girl was determined, and it was not Tianda. In 2019, a woman from Texas claimed to be Tianda, but it was later proven to be untrue. These two leads were deeply followed up on, and FBI had thought that they had a break in the case, but unfortunately, they didn't. It has been 20 years since the girls vanished without a trace. The extended family of the girls do hope that someday they will receive closure.